everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are the Minimalists. We're here with Malabama. Hi, everybody. TK Coleman. All is well. We've got the rest of our team here in the studio as well. And coming up today on this free public minimal episode, we're joined by Dr. Zach Bush, a triple board certified physician and internationally recognized educator and expert on the microbiome as it relates to health, disease, and food systems. Together, we're talking to a few listeners about decluttering the gut. Then, at the end of this episode, we are going to skip our lightning round segment because Dr. Bush has some shocking news to share with us. You can check out the full three-hour maximal edition of this episode where we answer five times the questions and we dive deep into some of the most eyebrow-raising conversations we've ever had on this show. That private podcast episode is out right now at patreon.com slash The Minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement-free because, say it with me, y'all, advertisements suck. By the way, if you're on the fence, Patreon is now offering free trials, so you can check out that full three-hour episode for free. You can test drive the Minimalist Private Podcast. You can join for seven days. Try it out. Just visit Patreon or Patreon page. Just click the link in the description uh, to this episode to subscribe, and you'll get your personal link so that our weekly Maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain access to all of our archives, all the way back to episode 001. That's a whole lot more of less. Let's start with our callers. If you have a question or comment for our show, give us a call, 406-219-7839, or email a voice recording to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Sherry. My name is Sherry Torres, and I'm a new Patreon subscriber. I am 61 years young. I'm postmenopausal, post-hysterectomy, 100% cancer-free, I want to have great gut health. Actually, I need to have great gut health. A few years back, I suffered for about a year with lymphocytic colitis um, as a result of regular ibuprofen use. I am now off all NSAIDs of any kind. Don't touch them anymore. But every time I go shopping for probiotics, I'm completely overwhelmed with all the different types, all the different dosages, all the different maladies that each one promises to combat. My question is, is there a non-confusing, non-overwhelming guide to adding probiotics to my diet? One of our listeners, Nastasia, wrote in. She said that um, we should do an episode about decluttering the gut. Mm -hmm. And I found that fascinating. And since Zach is here and he is an expert on gut health, I thought this was a great question to start with. So Dr. Bush, when we're talking about probiotics, that's a a sliver of the picture. We're talking about gut health. There's so much that goes into it. When in doubt, I tend to avoid the synthetic route, whether that is Mm. um, uh, ibuprofen, as she mentioned. I mean, any of these sort of prescription or over-the-counter drugs that are abused often damage the gut, but there's so many other things that damage our gut. Can we talk about some of those things? Yeah, to to reflect on the question there, you know, we've got somebody who's gone through some health crisis and you've got multiple surgeries and you have history of probably intensive drug treatment on top of that, radiation therapy, all this that we put people through when they have something like cancer. And so uh, Western medicine, which is my background, 17 years in academia there in academic medicine, practicing not only the clinical side, but also the basic scientists working on chemotherapy development at the University of Virginia over the years. And I was trained into this belief that um, the system of the body was actually really predictable. Like, you know, here's, here's the receptor, we can hit that with a drug and this mm-hmm. will happen. And so we had this very Newtonian training that here it is, this is the machine, you push this lever and this happens, it's very predictable. And so they want you to believe that because that's the only way that we could actually intervene as a reductionist approach of a pharmaceutical industry to actually, you know, create change. And they they did this in such a way that uh, you never see the forest for the trees, right? And so you're so focused on your one tree that you can't realize that you're part of a larger system, whether you're a, a drug developer or a clinician. 
you're always just seeing this small segment and you can't see the forest for the trees, which will be a theme that will play off into today's episode, I think, is we, we never quite get to see the full picture and therefore mm. we keep making these reductionist decisions mm. about the world. Mm. And therefore we can go down these deep rabbit holes of belief, not realizing that we left the rails four decades past. Mm. And so now in a pharmaceutical world, we're trained, here's a receptor that causes high blood pressure. And here's a drug that interrupts that pathway. And so this is going to lower your blood pressure. But what is missed there is that there's this huge cascade of events that are occurring around that receptor. Mm. And we forget that this is a symphony of 70 trillion cells that are dancing with 1.4 quadrillion bacteria that are dancing with 14 quadrillion mitochondria, mm. all of which are different species that are interplaying through genetics, through uh, hormonal cascades, through something called uh, redox chemistry or uh, this kind of cellular system of, of wireless communication. So you have this exquisite network and then you take something like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, which is a sledgehammer on just a very narrow spectrum of, of biology and the whole thing gets out of balance. And so the experience of I've taken these NSAIDs for a while and then my body went haywire is predictable, unfortunately. And NSAIDs, just for, for clarification, can you, can you talk more about yeah, that? Yeah, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, the common ones are ibuprofen, you know, the brands are things like Motrin and the like. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're in contrast to, to Tylenol, which is acetaminophen, which is a, a pathway that disrupts liver metabolism. This is a, uh, something that disrupts the cascade of inflammation within the cell. Mm. And uh, what we find is these things do disrupt the ecosystem of the body. And there's a lot of common over-the-counter drugs that do this. I would say that ibuprofen is the most commonly abused that is directly damaging, but aspirin is right up there with high damage to the gut lining. Uh, there's a lot of people that believe that aspirin trying to get onto the market today would have never made it by FDA regulations because it causes so much gut bleeding, so much mortality from aspirin. But here we've had it for 100 years, so it kind of got grandfathered into the process. But it's a dangerous you know, compound that really screws up a whole you know, slew mm -hmm. of, of issues in the gut and beyond. So we take these medications. Another one that's very common now that you can actually buy by the near gallon at Costco is, is Miralax for constipation. Mm. And so ironically, that's a common complication of chronic abuse of anti-inflammatories and like. So you're taking anti-inflammatories, then your bowels start to get off. The neurology gets screwed up. You start to get constipation patterns. And now you're taking Miralax. And both of those drugs do disrupt the really foundation of gut health, which is the tight junctions, which are the Velcro-like proteins that keep your gut as a coherent barrier to the outside world. And so what we start to realize is that the pharmaceutical industry in its effort to intervene on complex systems starts to disrupt the regenerative quality of the body. The body should be repairing constantly. And your expression of disease is going to be equal to your rate of injury versus your rate of repair. As your rate of repair starts to go down, your rate of injury starts to accumulate damage, and that damage accumulates into what we call chronic diseases. Right. And so these anti-inflammatories and many other drugs on the market, Miralax and the like, unintentionally start to fuel the chronic disease epidemic because mm. it's slowing the repair process down. And so that would be things like your ibuprofen, your aspirin, they're slowing down repair process. Anything that disrupts the normal acute inflammatory reaction, which is your reaction to injury, if you start to dull that, you're not, you're not addressing the injury. Mm. And so you're starting to accumulate disease. But like you said, it goes far beyond the pharmaceuticals. The other side of the pharmaceutical industry is the chemical agriculture side. And so the herbicides and pesticides that saturate our food system today are antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. And mm -hmm. so they actually are functioning to destroy the same pathways, but now at you know a ecosystem level much greater than what might happen if you just ingested an ibuprofen. You're now ingesting in your water, your food system, you're actually breathing it, it's raining on you. About 85% of the rain measured in the U.S. is positive for glyphosate, the most common weed killer herbicide on the market. And that's a very potent antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And so... As we start to be steeped in these chemicals, the air we breathe, 85% of the air we breathe contaminated. So every breath you take now is starting to diminish your ecosystem repair and your ecosystem communication. And for that, we end up with this diminished capacity for regeneration and repair. And unfortunately, that's not just happening in the human gut. It's also happening in the gut of the world, which is the soil. 
And so our soil systems, which is the gut of the planet and the, responsible for the whole metabolism and repair process of the planet is de- decrementing at the same rate that our gut is. And so for this, we see the collapse of ecosystems. And so all this talk about CO2 in the atmosphere, all that, that's that's chasing literally after the wind. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's that's a very tiny fraction, 0.04% of our atmosphere is CO2. Mm-hmm. That's not causing extinction. What's causing extinction is the destruction of the gut of the planet and humans on it. Mm-hmm. And so we are losing the ecosystem communication, the ecosystem regenerative capacity of the planet. And this woman is experiencing that. Mm-hmm. And her question is around probiotics. Mm-hmm. And she said, go to the market and we have a $47 billion industry now built around probiotics Mm -hmm. globally. And it turns out that probiotics are three or seven species that you take in very high dose. So you're taking billions and billions. They'll brag about it too on the label, 50 billion copies, 100 billion copies of this bacteria, this bacteria. (laughs) Every time I see that, I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like (laughs) 50 billion what? Anyway. That's it. And, yeah. and you can't wrap your mind around that number either. Like nobody actually can picture a billion bacteria. Wow, it's a lot. I think I'll go for the more. Right. Yeah. That, that's the other Worth disease better. we have is more, more, yeah. more, right? So well, more probiotics, that's probably going to help me out as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's the minimalist approach to gut health <laughs> is really starting to back up and say, well, what does the forest look like? What does an ecosystem of the gut look like? And the answer is pretty amazing. The American Gut Project, which is mistermed because most of the work's been done over in Africa, but they've been looking at what is the ideal gut flora look like of a human. And so they're studying hunter-gatherer tribes over in Kenya and other places to realize that a, an ideal gut that's really in, ta- in touch with its ecosystem, in touch with its food directly, it's hunting, it's touching the hide of the animals it eats, it's touching the honeycomb that it consumes, it's touching the nature from which its foods come. 40,000 species of bacteria is pretty typical measurement. And, and our genomics aren't even very good yet. Like we're probably off by... T- 10x at least. So somewhere in that 40,000 to 400,000 is probably the right number of species of bacteria Mm. alone. And that's logarithmically outnumbered by the number of fungi, yeast, protozoa, all these other organisms in the gut. The American gut, in contrast, has 10,000 species at best, Mm. typically more like five to 8,000 species. So we've lost 75% as Western consumers, Western eaters, we've lost 75% of the workforce or 75% of the ecosystem. And, and there are a few reasons wow. for that, just to, to clarify here. One is what you mentioned, the, the overuse of over-the-counter prescription drugs. For example, I had a doctor who gave me an antibiotic for 13 years that I took daily, totally decimated my gut. You couple that with the glyphosates and other pesticides that are in conventional foods. A a regular tomato you get from Ralph's, if it's conventional, it's been sprayed by glyphosate or some other pesticide. And one dose of that, probably not a big deal to the average human being. We continue to assault ourselves over and over and over. And then, of course, the foods we're eating, the heavily processed foods, don't. Or they, they also don't help with the, uh, uh, the overall gut health of the human being. That's right. And so what we've done is say, well, here's the probiotic. Here's three species that will fix your gut. And so we give you billions of copies of three, or now there's like seven species probiotics on the market. And there's even like Garden of Life, I think has a 25 species one. Mm. But 25 species at billions of copies, when you're supposed to have 40,000 species, is the exact same thing that we've done with farming. Is mm. Here's a monocrop of corn, soybean, and wheat. You go plant those three species over 125 million acres, what could possibly go wrong? And the answer is, well, the ecosystem starts to fundamentally collapse because you eliminate all the biodiversity of, of, mm. of the flora on the, on the planet. In the same way, we go in with a monocrop of probiotics and say, well, here's three species. And then the, it's, and you can see that all the marketing companies, even the, the really fancy new, you know, probiotics on the market are launched by marketing teams, not by scientists. Right. Mm. And it's like, okay, we have an idea. It's going to look more beautiful and we're going to go after this thing and, and so these marketing teams come up with the new look, the new feel, the new you know, messaging about, because guy health is a massive, you know, near trillion dollar industry mm-hmm. coming on here. And so everybody's got a lot of space to compete. But the scientists started to get concerned, you know, decades back of like, wow, I wonder if this is even good for somebody, you know, in, in the 1970s and 80s, starting to pound people with billions of copies of three species. And so the studies started to get done. And finally, the definitive ones got published in 2018 to show that we were actually diminishing the microbiome diversity and recovery after antibiotics using probiotics. And so the probiotic after two weeks of antibiotics 
two weeks of antibiotics to start with will decimate your ecosystem by another 80%. So you're already missing 75% of your ideal gut. You take an antibiotic for two weeks and you've lost another 80%. Wow. So you're down to a couple thousand species of bacteria and your gut's now going to struggle back to get back to its baseline of 10,000 species. And the studies that needed to be done that finally got done were placebo controlled. And so they took sugar pills basically and they showed complete gut recovery back to a baseline within 30 days hmm. versus probiotic that followed out six months still had never recovered. Wow. And so they showed the same level of suppression of the microbiome with a probiotic as the antibiotic had caused. And now, let so, me ask you, does that also apply to natural probiotics? So like, for example, I will drink <laughs> kefir daily, like coconut, a raw coconut kefir or a raw dairy kefir. <laughs> I assume that's a little bit different than the pill antibiotic. Probably not, unfortunately. Mm. So most of your most of your yogurts and kefirs are single species ferments, and so they'll add acidophilus or one of these you know classic fermentation things. To get away from that, you have to have what would be called a wildly fermented uh, product. And wild fermentation is a process where you expose the sugar water basically to air. Mm -hmm. And the air is delivering thousands of species of yeast, bacteria, all kinds of flora, and then you start to get it. And so this is the classic sauerkraut that was made in a crock in your grandmother's basement, right? maybe your great-grandmother's basement. But crocks were like handed down generation to generation because it was one of the most important ways to preserve food. Mm -hmm. And we did that right up until the 1950s when refrigeration got so cheap and universal that we just got lazy and we started doing vinegar pickles and things that could be stuck in the fridge and not necessarily kept at room temperature for, for years. Mm -hmm. And so that loss of fermentation in the wild setting led to a decrement of true gut health for mm -hmm. us in the 1950s, 60s. And then we started adding herbicides, pesticides over those decades and we started destroying ecosystems. So it was a loss of a food culture and the, and the innovation of antibiotics as a crop treatment that really started to destroy the ecosystem of health. And so that's where we see the sudden acceleration of collapse of ecosystems and global warming and all these stories starting to come out in the 1980s, 90s. And so you start to see this, the emergence of the chronic disease epidemics of the 1990s that now explodes. And that, so that's autism in our children. It's asthma in our children. It's eczema in our children. It's attention deficit disorder. All that stuff was un, untold before 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, 1992, we, we start spraying wheat with glyphosate directly to dry it out right before harvesting it. And we suddenly get gluten sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And so we don't actually have gluten sensitivity. We have glyphosate sensitivity. And so we've been poisoned by our own agricultural system, and this is leading to this destruction of gut health. And then we answer it with probiotics. Mm. Uh, no problem. Here's your three species. Mm. And mm. so what we've done as a laboratory for the last 10 years is we've been utilizing not bacteria, but the communication network of bacteria as an answer to gut health. And so we extract these small carbon molecules made by bacteria and fungi in soil systems and deliver that back to the human body so they can get the, that cell-cell communication back in touch. And when you get communication, you get recovery. You accelerate repair across all systems. And so we've been studying the influence of this cellular communication of bacteria on human cell systems for the last 15 years. And it just explodes the, the rate of repair. And like I said, rate of injury versus rate of repair is how young are you? How much disease do you carry? Mm -hmm. And so to see people accelerate their youth, accelerate their repair process has been really exciting and humbling because it's not a human system. It's a microbial system that accelerates human repair. Right. And right. so in the end, what we're really saying is the belief that there's such a thing as human health is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. There's planetary health. There's ecosystem health. And we are an expression of that ecosystem. Mm. Human life and human health is an expression of an ecosystem mm. of millions of species, fungi, yeast, bacteria, all the rest. And so we are an expression of nature. And until we come to terms with that, we're going to continue to battle nature. We're going to war against that nature. Mm. Yes. Can we get practical it, for a second <clears throat> for Sherry to wrap up her question? Because she's at a point now where she's probably suffering to some extent. And that suffering is not because of her gut health necessarily, but it is exacerbated significantly by a damaged gut. And so someone like that, as opposed to saying, hey, here are your probiotics, have a nice day. What do we tell her from a practical standpoint? Yeah. So getting back in touch with your ecosystem is the answer. And so looking at the fermented foods being a good example for pennies, you can it's water and, and, and salt. And so you create water-salt combination. It's called a brine. 
and then you put your cabbage in there for two dollars. Mm-hmm. And within two weeks, you have a huge vat of sauerkraut that would have cost you twenty five bucks at the grocery store. And so, for pennies, you can start to do gut recovery by being in communication with the air around you and allowing that air to begin to do it. Keeping in mind that the air that you're breathing may be contaminated with herbicides and everything. So it's really like. How do we start to get the intelligence back into our air system? The answer is get back in touch with nature. And so an interesting concept would be take that crock, that towel over it, and go and take a hike in the woods and Mm. set that under a tree in in the woods for a few hours and see what that forest wants to deliver to your gut through that. And so getting back in touch with nature through a literal reconnect, a literal reintroduction of what nature has and its diversity is a key feature. And so the hashtag breathe your biome has been one of the big things that I launched 10 years ago. And the concept is if you are out in nature in different ecosystems, every minute you're out there, you're introducing new life to your body. And for that, you're diversifying the body. So fermented foods, getting out in nature, hiking in it, swimming in it, diving in it, whatever you're doing, get out in nature and touch it. And then if you want a deep dive on the science of that soil microbial communication network, intelligenceofnature.com can get you that big body of science that we've developed over the last 15 years. And you can start to drink some of that, you know, small amounts, just a few few milliliters, you know, a teaspoon a day can start to move you in that direction of reconnection to the communication network of life. And so that accelerates the tight junction repair and builds that barrier between the outside world and your immune system to reignite that healthy relationship between you and the world around you, the world within you. We now know that there's an ecosystem within you as well, not just in your gut, but the brain has bacteria, fungi, yeast in it that are a healthy ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so these systems that we thought were sterile and had to be sterile to be healthy, we're now realizing are these diverse ecosystems. And and as we kill the ecosystem, we lose health. And so as you reintegrate into the nature from which you have emerged, you're going to rediscover yourself. And so for, for you you know, here coming out of chronic disease, the chronic disease was there as an invitation back into nature. And so for all the fearful statistics and all that, nature is just wrapping us up in her arms saying, come on back. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Sherry, we'll put a link to any of the resources that we mentioned today throughout the podcast in the show notes over at theminimalists.com. So you'll have access to them over there. And now a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Oh, that would be absolutely awful. Thankfully, advertisements suck. We don't do any ads. Y'all know that. Big shout out to our Patreon subscribers. I wanted to interrupt this podcast episode with Dr. Zach Bush. We're talking about decluttering the gut. And I wanted this to be the definitive place where people can go to optimize their gut, to heal their gut. Mm. Longtime listeners of the podcast will know that I've gone through some terrible gut health over the last four and a half years, and I've been able to nurse myself back to health to heal my gut to a great extent, and in fact, heal my life in general, because gut health is health. If you don't have gut health, you will suffer. That's the biggest thing I've learned over the last five years. So I wanted to Step in here for just a moment, interrupt the podcast with Dr. Zach Bush and talk about some things. I didn't want to interrupt the flow with him. And so talk about some things I know he would be on board with, but these are things that help me specifically. They may or may not help you if you're listening to this episode, but these are the things that help me heal my gut. The first thing I did was I eliminated anything that damages my gut microbiome, anything that damages the mucosal wall of the intestinal tract. So that's a one cell thick layer. We call it leaky gut when it gets disrupted, right? And there are a lot of foods, drugs, alcohol, any of that stuff can disrupt your mucosal layer, could cause it to be permeable. And that creates that leaky gut that allows a bunch of things, toxins to leak into your system that you don't want. The two big foods for me were seed oils and processed foods, getting those out of my diet. Listen to episode 384 of the Minimalist Podcast uh, because we did a whole episode about food clutter and what foods to subtract for you, from your life in order to have optimal health, including optimal gut health. The second thing I did was removing fiber from my diet for a period of time. Eating low fiber or no fiber foods was hyper important to me. It's not that I think fiber is inherently bad, but if you have a injured gut, just like uh, TK, if you had an injured arm right now and it had a big ulcer on it and I went over and started rubbing on it really hard, you'd be like, hey man, get off that. It really, really hurts. And fiber can do the same thing to a damaged gut. Now, if I went over to your 
smooth, clean, muscular arm. Now and start rubbing, you'd be like, ooh, that feels kind of nice, yeah, right? Yeah. But if you have a damaged gut, you want to stop the damage. You want to keep damage it. And high fiber foods were really damaging my gut. I had to remove all fiber from my diet for a period of time. For me, it ended up being a couple years. Wow. I don't necessarily, I'm not recommending that to anyone, but understanding it doesn't happen overnight. The gut healing takes some time and we don't want to re-offend, re-injure the gut. And when it came to repopulating the gut with the good bacteria, that we want. You often hear about probiotics, but as Dr. Bush talks about on this podcast episode, a probiotic can only go so far. I prefer to have fermented foods. There's a great book called The Art of Fermentation. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Every day I'm eating really high quality fermented carrots and beets and cabbage and kimchi. I'm also drinking water kefir or coconut water kefir. That was really important for me and my gut health repopulated my gut because I took antibiotics for 13 years. Don't recommend that, but it decimated my gut. It made my gut feel awful and it got rid of all the good guys in my gut, which made room for a lot of the bad guys to come in and wreak havoc. And I had terrible bowel movements. My bowel movements are great now. I had awful indigestion, IBS, IBD, ulcers in my small bowel. I had significant problems in the gut. So I had to repopulate the gut with good bacteria. Why were you taking this for over a decade. A doctor said that I had this uh, scalp acne, these nodular cysts on my head. I didn't know at the time it was a soy allergy. And he said, oh, here's a quick fix. And of course, being a standard American, I that's what I really wanted was the quick fix. We didn't talk about diet. We didn't talk about anything that might affect my skin. But your skin is a manifestation of gut dysfunction. So whenever I have a <sighs> gut dysfunction, it will manifest in several ways. One is blemishes on the skin or even autoimmune immune conditions, eczema, psoriasis, things like that. And a pill will help with the symptoms, but it's not going to cure the problem. What will is getting a healthy gut microbiome together. And so what I've done is I reintroduce fermented foods that we make at home. You can buy some fermented foods at the store, but it's much better to make your own fermented foods, high quality. You get all the strains of bacteria that are going to help out. However, I will say this, start small and start slow. You want to be really careful. I remember once I took a just a regular probiotic that a doctor recommended. This was a few years ago and I ended up in the hospital because my gut wasn't ready for that much gut new bacteria being introduced into my gut. And so when I say start small, I mean literally small. I take some coconut raw coconut water kefir that you can either make at home or you can buy a really high quality organic raw one from a store and literally would dip my finger into it and just barely get it into my mouth because I found if I took a big swig of it, it wreaked havoc on my gut. You work your way up. You start small. And the same is true with any fermented foods as well. A lot of bacteria there. And if your gut's not ready for it, uh uh-oh, that's also going to cause a problem. But if you slowly introduce those things, what you're doing is you're improving your gut health. Now, the average person, if they don't have dysbiosis in their gut, fermented foods are still a great idea because 80% of your immune system is in your gut. What you're doing is you're fortifying your gut and thus fortifying your immune system. Our immune system is our health. A few other things I've done really quick. Colostrum uh, has helped in the past. It has a lot of essential nutrients. It's the first milking of a cow or a ruminant animal. And that is helpful because those nutrients are what really helps a baby become healthy. It gives them what they need. And so, uh, again, you may be sensitive to something like dairy. And so be really careful with something like that. There's also, there are supplement companies like Heart and Soil, no affiliation to me, but uh, that sell colostrum so that you can you can take a, just a quick capsule of colostrum, but always start small. If you have a sensitivity, that's probably something I would avoid altogether. Stick with the fermented foods. And then also understanding what is going wrong with your gut. I've done a thousand, well, probably literally dozens of different tests for my gut, testing my microbiome through my poop. The only one that I found to be especially helpful was from a company called Para Wellness. ParaWellnessResearch.com. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. 
you basically get your poop tested and they tell you what's going on there. What parasites, what bacterias are invasive? Do you have an overgrowth of growth of yeast? That was a big problem for me because when we got rid of all that bacteria in my gut through the antibiotics, we made room for all the yeast to just overgrow. And so I had something called CIFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. I had an abundance of fungus in my gut and para wellness gives you ways to deal with that naturally so you don't necessarily need a prescription to deal with any of these gut parasites, yeast, or bacteria. A few other things that have nothing to do directly with the gut, but help my gut health and my inflammation significantly. Grounding. Uh, You can go back and listen to our episode with Clint Ober about grounding. Phenomenal episode. I ground every day. Now, grounding is absolutely free. Just get your bare feet on the ground. I also use some grounding products from earthing.com. Also not a sponsor. I'm sitting on a grounding mat right now. TK is standing on a grounding mat as well. I sleep on a grounding mat at night. Staying grounded really helps me. They also have a great documentary. It's about 15 minutes long. You can learn the science behind grounding and why it is so important for your life to reduce inflammation because a lot of the gut dis-ease that we have is gut inflammation, systemic inflammation, and grounding helps ease and eliminate Mm. the inflammation throughout our entire body. A few other things I've done that help my immune system, cold exposure and hot exposure. So cold through ice baths or cold showers really helps. I used to just throw a bunch of ice into a bathtub. I'm lucky enough to have an ice bath in my backyard. Now I've been doing this for years at this point, but now I do it every single day because I have access to it. If you don't have access to a a cold plunge, you can simply do a cold shower for two minutes a day. That cold exposure, it increases or it helps out your immune system. Mm. And so if you're helping your immune system. You're also helping your gut because 80% of your immune system is in your gut. Heat exposure as well. I sauna two or three times a week. You could also do a hot tub or something like that, but or a hot shower, but finding a local sauna, your local YMCA or a local athletic club or finding a friend that has a sauna, doing that two or three times a week. TK. By, by the way, quick question related to the cold shower. Let's say I get in and for, for three, two minutes, I do the cold thing and I'm like, ah, but then at the end of that two minutes, I'm like, all right, I'm going back to comfort land. No, nope. Have I deprived myself of the benefit? Yeah, all the benefits, you always want to end with cold. And that's really important. So like this morning, I got into the ice bath. I spent three minutes in the ice bath and I shiver myself to warmth. That's uh-huh. where most of the benefits come. And I do it daily, at least two minutes. Here's the trick though. I think an ice bath is actually easier than an ice bath shower, a cold shower. Even though it's much colder, the full submersion is so much better than having that water just spraying at me chaotically. Although, well, the best thing is whatever you're going to do. So cold exposure helps your immune system. Heat exposure helps your immune system. Now keep in mind, none of this is medical advice. So please consult your doctor, your dentist, your shaman, your Pilates instructor, and your local rodeo clown before taking your life into your own hands. I I need to hear the disclaimer in Bama's voice, please. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, one more thing. It's my birthday this week, y'all. And I only ask this once a year. Every podcast, we're not hopping on here and say, hey, please uh, rate and review our podcast because I don't want to clutter your podcast with public service announcements, but it's my birthday. Will you be willing to get me a birthday gift that I will actually enjoy? I don't need more cufflinks. I don't need a tie. I don't need a birthday cake. All I need is a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you hop on there and just say, hey, I really enjoy this podcast. Give us five stars. Give us a review. That would be really helpful. I ask for this one time a year on my birthday so we don't clutter every podcast episode that you listen to. Would you be willing to get me a birthday gift right now? It's my 42nd birthday. And the best gift you can get me is leave us a review, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You know, we have over 16,000 reviews on Apple and we read every one of them. Spotify just started doing reviews recently. So if you listen on Spotify, please give us a review. That helps us reach more ears with our message of less. And if you watch this on YouTube, you can subscribe to this channel. You know, almost 70% of the people who watch our videos on YouTube do not subscribe to our channel. Now is a great chance to do it. You're not going to see me hop into every video and say, please like and subscribe. This is the one time a year. If you want to subscribe, we'd really appreciate it. We appreciate y'all. That's right. And the, the fact that we don't accept ads on our YouTube videos actually hurts us because we are not a priority because we're not profitable to YouTube in the way that other people who run ads are. And so what that means, it's harder for us 
to be seen. That's one of the prices that we pay for the stance that we take. And so each time you leave a comment or you subscribe and you hit like, you increase our visibility on YouTube so that if you support what we do and you want more people to hear these ideas, you give them a chance to see it in their timeline, newsfeed, or whatever it is they call it, in the Every, recommended videos. And everything I talked about today with respect to healing your gut, we'll put links to those in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. All right, let's get back to the show. I want to tune into one more question here that I think ties into that perfectly. This one is from Jean on Facebook. I already eat mostly organic whole foods, but are there any foods I should avoid or even prioritize to help keep my hormones balanced? So we did an episode recently with Dr. Paul Saladino about food clutter, and he talked about some things to remove from the diet that are foods we've introduced that have basically gotten us away from nature. So seed oils is a big one processed carbohydrates, anything that's essentially in a package has been sitting on a shelf for a long period of time. It's a food product, but it's not really the food that you're talking about. Artificial sweeteners, anything with pesticides, glyphosates, et cetera. Um, alcohol as well. Mm -hmm. uh, these things that are not necessarily in our nature. I, I don't know that that's not really a comprehensive list, but I think it's probably a good place to start. It's often about subtraction more than it is about addition. We were always looking, what foods can I, what can I put into my body to make it better? But quite often, subtraction is greater than addition. And I, I think you just answered that classic question in the nutrition world is, you know, what should we eat? Should we be vegan? Should we be paleo? Should we be keto? Uh, because I know people that went keto and they only eat meat and they feel better. And then I know people who went vegan and they feel better. Well, the answer is both those communities stopped eating the packaged food. <laughs> and so mm. it, it's not about what you're eating. It's about what you've eliminated. And so this is why you can hear such vehement bickering and fighting between those camps is because they actually felt better. Mm. <laughs> and so they are convinced <laughs> by their deductive reasoning that, well, it must be the meat that's making me feel better. It must be the veggies that are making me feel. No, it's the lack of canola oil in your right, bloodstream. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's literally the elimination of these, these highly processed things that are making you feel better. And so the reality is whole food is the only diet that counts. And so if you're going after whole food, you're going to win the game. And biodiversity, again, wins the game in that story. And so I do get concerned when people are saying, you know, I eat chicken for six months and I feel much better. I'm like, yeah, that is one amino acid. <laughs> you are loading your body with a single amino acid for months. And all you have to do is go hang out with a carnivore to realize that's a ridiculous way to eat. Mm -hmm. Because if you go hang out with a lion and you watch them take down the wildebeest, they never go and eat the muscle. They're not eating the steak initially. They instead rip open the belly and they eat 40 pounds of organic composted greens mm -hmm. out wow. of the gut of that thing before they ever touch the meat. Yeah. Because they know they're going to be constipated to beat the band if they just go after the muscle and they go eat a bunch of steak, they're not going to be able to move their bowels. And so the reason why Costco is now selling near gallon sizes of Miralax is because we have this protein addiction and this protein you know, treatment for <laughs> diet right now that's just all meat. Yeah. And when you just put meat in the gut, it takes about 14 hours from it moved from your stomach to your colon. 14 hours mm. versus you know that high fiber diet that the lion is eating on the front end of it, or the vegan eating their vegan meal with the same calories, it passes in 90 minutes. Mm. So it's either an hour and a half or 14 hours, you choose your transit time. But you're going to have to keep that thing moving because by the time you're eating lunch tomorrow, you still have two more meals backed up in your gut, you know, that are still trying to process through. And so mm -hmm. it's this journey into this slow bowel thing that then leads to, you know, these pharmaceutical solutions and taking heavy dose magnesium and Miralax and everything else to keep your bowels moving. And so... I've never seen a lion take a bunch of magnesium. I was just going to say, Miralax, <laughs> Miralax <laughs> now for lions. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. This is the time where we usually enter into our lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. By the way, you can follow The Minimalist on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter at The Minimalist. We'll put links to Dr. Zach Bush's 
social media handles as well, but we're going to forego the lightning round today. I do have one piece of uh, news for you. Our first film, Minimalism, a documentary about the important things after 80 million views and seven years on Netflix. If you missed it last week, it just came out on YouTube. So you can find that now, uh, youtube.com slash The Minimalist or over at minimalism.com. You can watch the full documentary for free and 100% advertisement free as you know with our podcast our patreon subscribers keep our podcast and our youtube channel 100 percent advertisement free because advertisements suck yeah let's move on to right here right now i'm gonna hand the floor over to ryan and dr bush usually we use this segment to talk about one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist and one thing that happened is Ryan and uh, his wife, Mariah, and Dr. Bush, they went out to lunch last week, and Ryan calls me afterward, and he said, hey, Dr. Bush wants to come on the podcast, and he has, he has something to talk about. And he told me what it was, and I, if it wasn't Ryan Nicodemus and Dr. Zach Bush, I would have hung up the phone, mm. turned it off, changed my phone number, and moved to a new city. Wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, Ryan, do you want to set this up and then we'll let uh, you can set the pins up and Dr. Bush can bowl them over. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, it's uh, it's interesting because I've never had to set up a conversation like this before. But, yeah, when we were having lunch, you um, just kind of delivered something to me that, that really blew my mind. And, you know, Dr. Bush, because I respect you so much, man. It's like I could not not take you seriously. <laughs> so um, I guess like with that being said. With that being said, um, maybe you could tee it up for our audience and why, why you're why you're really here today. Yeah, so I, I can't remember honestly if we got into in the last podcast, but a lot of my last fifteen years has dealt with the microbiome, looking at how bacteria and fungi interact with the human immune system, and then deeper than that, the human neurology. And one of the big, big aha moments of this last fifteen years is the concept of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the concept of intelligence as human is starting to disappear because we're starting to realize all the data that is inputted into your brain to create patterns of information that would be, then be able to exhibit intelligence are being inputted by bacteria and fungi. Mm. And so this has been a lot of my work is to realize that human consciousness only occurs because we are the most biodiverse ecosystem interacting with a single neurology. To put that in a tighter box, the human colon in its anatomy, its exact anatomical structures has perfected the ability to hold more ecosystem variety than any other colon in the history of the planet. Wow. Meaning we can touch more species of bacteria, fungi, yeast, protozoa than any other species has ever touched with our neurology. And we now know that the nerves that innervate the gut lining, many of them are piercing the gut lining and sticking the snout of these neurons straight into the milieu of the bacteria, fungi, and the rest. And for that, we're starting to realize the fingers on the keyboard of your computer are non-human. Mm. They are literally coming from the ecosystem itself, inputting information into you that would then become intelligence. Mm. And it looks like species and their intelligence are directly linked to how much of nature can speak through you. And so this concept of human intelligence is starting to evaporate into the microbiome and nature itself being the source of intelligence. Mm. And so the conversation we got into last week was kind of the macro version of that is that we've spent a lot of time in science fiction and in conspiracy theory and everything else talking about extraterrestrial intelligence, mm -hmm. which the words mean extra beyond terrestrial, meaning earth intelligence, extraterrestrial intelligence. Is it possible that there's an intelligence out there in the universe? Mm -hmm. And the James Webb telescope has blown our minds, right? Yeah. We thought Hubble had shown us the universe and we thought we had maybe two, maybe 20 billion galaxies in the universe. And then James Webb is uncovered with a much higher resolution image of the universe. And we realized we were logarithmically off on that. That's more like 2.5 trillion galaxies in the universe. Wow. And when you start to wrap your head around 2.5 trillion galaxies, each of which has 10 billion suns. Yeah, you can't. It's You can't, yeah. yeah. I mean, the Milky Way has a quarter of a trillion planets, like just the one galaxy, let alone the however many trillions of galaxies there are, multiply that by a quarter of a trillion. Yeah, it's it's you can't grasp it. Although it's very interesting, the micro to macro. And so some of the best papers that I think have been written in physics this last decade 
have shown us that we sit mathematically in the center of the universe. Mm. Right between the biggest thing in the universe to the smallest thing in the universe, we sit in the mathematical center. It's called the universal scaling law. And so you take the frequency of resonance or the vibration of the universe itself, largest radius that we've ever measured is the universe. Mm. The, the frequency of resonance of that sets this very low hum. And it's cool that the universe has a sound to it. Yeah. Mm. Far, far below our detection capacity with our, our neurology, but it's humming. And at the highest pitch noise ever created in the universe is Planck's constant, which is the vibration of the electromagnetic field in a vacuum. You draw a straight line between those two and you can start to plot everything in nature from galaxies to quasars to suns to solar systems to planets to moons to a plant to a feather to an atom to you keep going down smaller and smaller. Ultimately, you find that that perfect line represents everything. The frequency mm. of resonance plotted against its radius or diameter. And dead center is freaking human biology. And so this thing that we call life seems to be the center point of the purpose of all of nature. Mm. And so the physicist and the sim here, I mean, has called us the event horizon, which is that disk that comes out of every black hole to create a galaxy. The event horizon is that magical plane in which all of the light is being compressed into particle state and expressing itself as an asteroid belt or planets or moons or suns. And so the way in which a black hole forms matter is this expression from waveform into particle state and expresses physical realm. And then the physical realm gets to, at some point, go from physics to biology. Mm. And that's when things get really bright. The difference between a sun and a single living cell is about 10,000 times brighter at the living cell level. Cubic centimeter by cubic centimeter, a cubic centimeter of the sun is 10,000 times dimmer than a cubic centimeter of mitochondria that power you with light energy. You burn 10,000 times brighter than the sun by the amount of light energy that is released by life. So what is life? It's a 10,000 time concentration of the brightest things physics ever created. Mm. And so life is a density of light expressed at the atomic level. Yeah. And it, interestingly, the, just to finish the yeah, thought, yeah. James Webb shows us 2.5 trillion galaxies, and then you multiply that by another 10 billion suns or something, you're starting to get into the same zone of the number of mitochondria inside your body oh. that release the light energy of those suns. And so we're at 14 quadrillion or so mitochondria. We could be off by a couple of zeros still. And you're up in those quadrillions of suns in the, in the universe. And so in these weird ways, we start to realize that nature is fractal. What's true at the micro level is true at the macro level. And these fractals of truth uh, emanate through it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was going to, well, uh, just kind of, you know, playing off of that. I've always thought, like, ever since I understood how... Um, you know, an atom works and, uh, you know, the, 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 I don't know, the, whatever rotates, the electrons rotates around the center. And I'm looking at that. Um, I don't, I was young when I saw this and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, this looks like a little mini solar system. Mm -hmm. And if you, so if you look at the way atoms work and the way our solar system works, it's, there's a, there's a center that things are spinning around, which is pretty, pretty, um, stinking fascinating. But something you said at lunch uh, last week was about how light can carry information. And it, I, I didn't understand it when you said it. And, uh, but I was, you know, I hold space for it and try to, try to understand it. But it just so happens like this is literally, uh, literally yesterday. I was looking up, um, because I go down these rabbit holes on YouTube with uh, math and physics and stuff, uh, the double slit experiment. Mm -hmm. And last month... Uh, what well, I should say in April, um, they just did the the double slit experiment with um, light, or I'm sorry, with yeah, with light, and through that they did it with time rather than like the actual slit. And I could go into what the double slit experiment is, but that's going to take ten or fifteen minutes to to uh, explain. But uh, the point being is, is they they proved that you can in fact. Uh, use light to carry information, which is, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty mind blowing. So, yeah. yeah. And so you start to peer out into the universe and you peer within the human gut and you peer within the human cell with all those mitochondria teeming within your cells. You know, 2000 mitochondria for every neuron that would be there. So 2000 little suns burning to, to ignite you into your capacity to have intelligence thought that's coming out of the ecosystem that lives within you and around you. And then you start to look at it 
trillion other galaxies with billions and billions of other suns with tens of billions of planets. And you start to really have to come to terms with, you know what, we're probably not alone, yeah. you know? And interestingly, the news that we're breaking right now around the world right now is only news to the West, really. Because mm-hmm. if you go hang out with any indigenous culture, they say, oh yeah, they there's been extraterrestrial intelligence all around us forever. And this is where the UFOs come and go. And mm. we go here and you can see them coming at night and they usually disappear into the water or they go into that pyramid. Or they, like, yeah, I've been in Africa, I've been in South America, I've been in uh, South Asia. And they all say the same thing. of Like, oh yeah, we're, we're constantly in communication with these things. Mm. And so the news that there's life outside of the planet is not news to humans. Mm. It's just news to a Western mind that decided that the only safe place to be is at the pinnacle top of everything. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And for that, the colonial mind, whether Western or Eastern or whatever, but that colonial mind that we need to control everything for our own safety because we fear death mm-hmm. is what has driven us away from the comfort with knowing that there's extraterrestrial life all over the place. Yeah. And so this is the news that's now breaking uh, big and, and you know, you listeners can go deep into this now. There's a long form interview with David Grush um, that's uh, released and David Grush is one of the you know, shining stars within our special forces. He was a physicist by training, went into special ops and uh, worked deeply with the military across different sectors, uh, was deployed in Afghanistan hero among us and uh, did deep work and then was assigned by the Department of Defense a couple of years ago to uh, be kind of the head of their their UFO task force uh, and in their UFO UAE, which is the unidentified aerial activities and things like this mm-hmm. that uh, people are terming the UFO activity. Uh, he went into it with uh, an incredible document that he wrote, which was, I'm going to go prove all of this is BS. There's mm. I am a physicist. I know that all of these, you know, stories of UFOs and abductions and everything else aren't true, blah, blah, blah. So he went in with eyes wide open, ready to prove it all wrong. And over the, the subsequent couple of years, you'll hear his own story in David Grush's long form interview that's coming out, um, you know, uh, this week on multiple different forms. But David's stories are about the fact that in the same way that we fear death, we fear uh, intelligence outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so this fear paradigm has driven a cover up that has been so thorough, but not perfect because we've all heard the stories of UFOs. We've all seen the declassified stuff that came out of the Trump administration, declassified a whole bunch of stuff, trying to get this story out a couple of years ago. But David Grush as, you know, head of, head of the department of defense, UFO project, gave all this testimony to the Senate arms committee and everything else in recent months. And so the stories are starting to break across all, all sectors now. Mm-hmm. The fact that there is a program called The Program mm-hmm. that's been mm-hmm. running for 90 years in the U.S. government. And The Program is uh, typically, as, as you'll see, anytime we're trying to hide information, we fracture the information. Mm-hmm. So you want doctors to not really understand cancer or disease in general, you fracture them. So you say, you're the specialist on that protein, you're the specialist on that receptor, you're the specialist here, and pretty soon nobody actually can see the forest from the trees, mm. and yet they all are told they're the smartest, most intelligent, most expert people on cancer. That was me 14 years ago, mm. expert in coop tf one a protein nobody's ever heard of, but I had a grant, I was studying it, I was developing chemotherapy for coop tf one receptor activation, blah, blah, blah. And so the same thing has happened at the governmental levels where information was fractured out of fear. Mm. We were afraid of the big story. Yeah. And we've been in a cold war basically against other governments since the 1940s uh, with the program. And the program has been designed to try to reverse engineer uh, extra human intelligence and their technologies for a warfare advantage. And so mm. we've been trying to get that paradigm shifting technology that we could dominate the Russians or the Chinese or whatever the stories have been over the last 90 years, it's out of this fear of we need to kill them before they can kill us. Mm. And the first, you know, really big recoveries of those craft that had enough technology to start to reverse engineer happened in Italy in 1933. And Mussolini and, and his group there took that content on. And then the Third Reich came in very quickly and confiscated all of that. And so the Third Reich was definitely working with these technologies that helped a lot of things leap forward during World War II. Jet aircraft, all kinds of things started coming out uh, of those German scientists because they had stuff that we hadn't seen before and they started to reverse engineer this stuff. Um, at the same time, 
you know, accident recovery sites were were achieved in in the U.S. and Roswell, New Mexico, and other places. And um, there's a whole you know task force in the military that that David and others are now describing that their job is to go and as soon as there's a suspicious wreck, they go take it and put it into hiding, and then they 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 try to figure out who can can reverse engineer this stuff. Hmm. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know which, <laughs> but again, it gets further fraction where the government loses track of that stuff because they assign it to private sector. And so now it's, you know, Raytheon or Boeing or all these big private contractors for the military that are given technology to say, can you figure this out? Can you reverse engineer this and all that? And so... Can you weaponize it? Can you weaponize it? Which is so fascinating. Ryan and I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. There's a great Air Force museum there. And you see right away, like... Oh, the Wright brothers are there. They're flying this little glider and mm. the, the the Wright flyer too. And within 10 years, what are we using it for? Mm, how do we one. kill people? <laughs> yeah, how do we shoot people in World War One? Yeah. And it sounds to me like there's that parallel. So I do want to dive deep into this extraterrestrial uh, mindset. But first, I just wanted to figure out why do you think that we tend to weaponize everything that we create, eventually we find a way to batter other people with it. Antibiotics, probiotics, the rest. <laughs> yes. Fear. Anti-cancer. <laughs> yes. Chemotherapy, radiation. Yeah. yeah. The war on cancer. Yeah. Mm. I mean, honestly, it's, it has, it's the same story over and over and over again. And it goes back to our first podcast. It is the fear of death. Mm. Yeah. That's it. Mm. Yeah. We literally are terrified of death. I'm going to kill what could kill me. Mm, yeah. And I am separate and therefore everything must be trying to kill me. Mm. Yes, this non-dual perspective it's this simple. Uh, is, is uh, we've lost it in a way, right? Everything has become this duality, the otherizing of everyone else. And not only am I separate from you, I'm on a pedestal apart from you. I'm the only non-idiot on the planet. Mm. Yes. We, are, we are trained so deeply into that belief that you, I am smarter and more deductive than anybody else around me. Mm. And therefore, my story must be right. Damn, that's dangerous. It's mm. so insidious mm. because it seems so safe. It's like, okay, I'm safe in my little bubble and I can see the forest for the trees. Nobody else can. And I'm not going to listen to other people that tell me what that story is. I'm not, not going to trust that. And so... It's a very insidious process that's led us to this belief that, my God, we humans, you know, have to be loved by God more than anybody else. And we are the purpose of God and all mm-hmm. that because we don't want to go to hell. You know, so we mm-hmm. created this whole other domain of the concept of hell to justify our fear of death. We had to create a story of hell to justify an inherent fear of death within us. Mm. But we're actually just expressing symptoms of a belief that what we see is what's real Mm. and everything else must not be real. And so if you only come to trust what you can physically see with your eyes, you are now trusting 0.00001% of the universe and believing that that constitutes the entire universe. Mm. Because for all those 2.5 trillion galaxies out there, it's still 0.0001% vacuum space. Right. Or 0.0 physical versus the vacuum space. 99.999% vacuum space Mm. that is full of all the light information. Mm. And so this is where we get into dark matter and all these fudge factors that we use mathematically because we weren't calculating the density of light within the electromagnetic field within that vacuum space. And it turns out it's 13 zeros more dense than all of the physical matter in the universe pressed into a cubic centimeter. One cubic centimeter of emptiness is 13 zeros denser than all physical structure of the entire universe, all 2.5 trillion galaxies pushed into that same cubic centimeter. It's 13 zeros longer for uh, an empty space state. And so we have so miscalculated the universe. And so this whole 94% of the universe must be dark matter and all this stuff. No, it's just light energy being expressed in the form of electromagnetic field within the vacuum. Hmm. That's the density of the universe. And that density then dictates the behavior of that 0.001%. Mm. And so we have come to believe a universe through this little pixel of reality. And then we tell ourselves all kinds of stories to justify the experience of believing that's all that there is. Mm. And so as we start to come to terms with the fact that there are intelligent systems within the universe that way out, out map our capacity and have been here for millions of years longer than we have likely, 
we have to start to back up and just say, what is real? Honestly, what is real? Mm. And the answer is light. Mm. There's only one thing that's real and that's expression of waveform or frequency of vibration in the universe. And from that comes everything else. And so are we going to pretend like everything is outside of ourselves is darkness or are we going to come to terms with it is all light energy mm. in the form of the electromagnetic field that is expressing life itself, expressing physical matter. It expresses the sun, the moon, the stars, the asteroids, everything else, and ultimately humanity. And so we have to come to terms with the fact that we bought into a fear paradigm that kept us locked in this tiny little box of beliefs, mm. tiny little box, and we were trained to fear everything outside of that box. Mm. And so as we come to terms with the fact of all this information now coming out and government officials not only saying that we've recovered the spacecraft, we've also recovered the alien, the alien intelligence. And I really like what they're doing and, and with David Grush's you know, explanation. He's so physics-oriented. I love, love the way he speaks. But he points out that calling them aliens is ridiculous because we don't actually have enough data to know where they come from. Mm. His point is they've probably been here long before humans because they've been around with these technologies likely millions of years versus our mere 300,000 years of humans. They've been around longer on Earth likely than us. Mm. And so what they're doing here, who knows, is this something they call home or is this an outpost? Is this a biologic experiment they're running here on the planet to create life? Who knows? But the fact is to call them alien is probably ridiculous because it suggests that they're over there and we're over here and they're from that star and we're from this star. And that's just not how life exists. Right. We are all an expression of one thing all at the end. And we are all home all the time. Mm. And I want to just emphasize that because I'm somebody who has walked around for decades feeling not at home. I had a box of belief about who I was and therefore I felt like an alien in my own planet. And I felt like I was not part of this human system because I didn't understand it. It didn't feel like home. It didn't feel comfortable. Mm. And in the end, I find out we are all home all of the time, everywhere in the universe, because we are the vibration of one source. We are the vibration of this universe. And this universe is expressing all of life here, all of it, whether it be from distant star systems or Earth, it's all there. Mm. And so first of all, there is no such thing as alien. There's only home and life is home in this universe. Mm. And so that's a reframing that I think we desperately need as we start to come to terms with all this news pouring out now from governments and everything else. As we come to terms with the fact that not only were there species recovered in these wrecks, there were living species recovered in these wrecks. Mm. And so these governments are now coming forward or at least government officials coming forward to acknowledge that there have been treaties signed with these other uh, species. And the U.S. seems to, by David's report and others, seems to be pointing to the Eisenhower administration to be the first president to sign a treatise with an, a, a non-human race or human species. An extraterrestrial. Wow. I mean, it, a terrestrial at this point. Right. <laughs> They're here. Right. Where they come from could be debated. Right. But it, a non-human intelligence. Yeah. Give it that. If I were to follow this down a path, because I'm still hyper skeptical about this, but if I follow down a path, wh what you're saying is it's potential that it's not extraterrestrial at all. It's just a species that started here and maybe went somewhere else and came back. That's a that's one of many possibilities. Mm. Yeah, and and David lays that out that it's possible things are, are coming from distant parts of the, these you know two point five trillion galaxies, but it's also possible we're looking at a future version of us that's mm. simply developed nonlinear reality because you, you you mentioned the slit experiment. What they prove is a slit experiment is time is totally relative, right? That's relativity with Einstein and everybody else saying actually time is totally bendable and you can bend space time. You can connect this dot in time to this distant dot in time. You can bring them right together and it can be the same thing. So as our species continues to progress, isn't it likely that over the next million years, we get nonlinear relationship through relativity and improved technologies for quantum physics interaction, all of that, or either that we get to the point where we let go of all, so much biologic trauma in our genetics and I let go of my ancestry completely and I become so present that mm. I am the, the highest technology in the land mm. and my body can now do space-time bending because I am no longer tied to a root system of epigenetic trauma. And so I believe we really are the highest technology on the planet. I mm. believe that nothing here, no spacecraft, anything else competes with the brilliance of what lies within me. 
And that technology, I believe, can do all kinds of things that we can't yet imagine in the human mind. And so is it really extraterrestrial intelligence we're dealing with or is it a future us that's coming back to try to move us forward? Oh, wow. They are they actually working about, uh, with, with us, not against us? Is possible. And so these are, the, these are the framings that I would invite all of you in the audience to start to, to just tr- sit with. Because I don't have your truths. I don't have your answers to this. And you're going to have to take in this information from not just David Grush, but P- Professor Nolan. A couple articles have already come out from Professor Nolan at Stanford. Uh, Nolan was approached by the CIA. He's a, a pathologist, microbiologist. Um, they approached him with 100 cases of, of humans that were presenting with very strange diseases and didn't tell them uh, anything more than that. Can you figure out what's going on in the neurology and the brains of these humans? And as a pathologist, microbiologist, you started to dissect kind of what was the the common injury at the neurology level of these people. And Dr. Nolan was then introduced to the reality that all of these people had one thing in common is that they were exposed to ac- extraterrestrial intelligence or, mm. or, or some sort of technologies coming from these non-human sources. And so these soldiers and other people being exposed to these technologies had these deep injuries to their 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 life form. Mm. And so they were trying to tease that out. So that was Nolan's introduction to, you know, this whole concept. Mm. And he's been able to, you know, be with and, and, and spend time with one of those orb technologies that you've seen on you know, a lot of the military air force images that are done of UFOs, you see these very fast traveling 20,000 mile an hour orbs that travel. They're just spheres that seem to have no propulsion, anything else. Mm-hmm. And so he's been able to study that one of those technologies and try to figure out what is the, what is the radiation source or whatever it is. And the answer is it's these isotopes of metals that, that don't really mm-hmm. exist on the planet. And so there seems to be some sort of true extraterrestrial energies or extraterrestrial materials within these technologies, whatever is being used, Mm. or it's an ability of humans to start to do transmutation of the elements where we can start to build elements from the periodic table with, with further discovery. So, so he's uncovering that biologic side while, while David is, is, you know, uncovering, you know, through the, through the department of defense. Again, he's department of defense contractor's wife, CIA. Like, it's not like this is Mm. tinfoil wearing people in, in New Mexico. This is really, the, the heart of our government and, and special forces and, and central intelligence agencies coming forward with this information. And again, I want to take us back to forgiveness mm. because I believe that one of our greatest dangers at this moment as this information comes out is that we further divide ourselves mm. and we fear again. And I started talking about this in podcasts during the pandemic when they started to release all the UFO data. I was like, ah, oh, this is perfect preparation for the next biggest fear paradigm story. Mm. So here we were in the biggest fear story that had ever been told. Here's a virus that's going to kill the planet. Everybody needs to go in your home. We're going to put tanks in the street. We're going to lock you all down for your own safety. Mm. And then as that started to remit and go away, oh my gosh, government's got alien information, Mm. all of these UFOs. The aliens are going to attack us. We need to print as the U.S. $40 trillion and we need to put tanks in the street. You need to go back in your home to hide away from the attack. Mm. And so I'm nervous that we're going to turn this into a fear paradigm instead of an opportunity to connect to a a universal intelligence. I want to get all the facts on the table here in a moment. And I also want to spend some time interrogating those facts Mm. together. I'm looking forward to to TK's. (laughs) Uh, He came here with half his brain tied behind his back, so I'm going to need him to untie that. (laughs) Well... Yeah, he, he, hold on. He, oh, he was he was hospitalized recently, and and so he's. Yeah, and I'm a little drugged up and all that stuff. <laughs> he's back right now. This is the second episode since that hospitalization. But mm-hmm. I do want to interrogate those facts. I want to get them on the table, and I think the three of us we need to find ways to push back in a way that helps give us a deeper understanding of exactly what the implications are of that. So I think we'll spend another thirty or forty five minutes talking about that. But first, let me play a few minimalist insights from some of our listeners. Hi, this message is for the breakup episode. Hi, this is Tess in Seattle, and I recently had a breakup with a boyfriend, and I know this is more of a comment than a question. I have just found that being in situations that are not the right situations to be in, be it family, friends, or a boyfriend, sometimes have us do things that are not so good, and sometimes that means buying things or being more, I guess, of a consumer than an experiencer of things. 
And I have found that since my breakup, things just really don't matter. And that life is actually pretty awesome and experiences me more and more. And I just think that sometimes we don't realize that we're in the middle of something that isn't the right place. So keep an eye, I guess, in my idea is keeping an eye on when are you doing things that aren't healthy and when are you doing other things in your private time that aren't optimal. And then stop and think what's around you and, and what makes you do that. Thank you. All right. Wow. Um, mm. We just had a conversation. Yeah. And we, you got a little bit of it on this minimal episode. You can head on over to patreon.com slash the minimalist seven day trial for free. Go ahead and listen to the full conversation. That's really all I can say because we dive deep in ways that I think we disagreed with Dr. Bush. <laughs> we didn't completely understand Dr. Bush. He's talking about aliens, extraterrestrial, <sighs> UFOs. It's, yeah, it's crazy, man. I, I never thought that we would ever talk about anything like this on the podcast. And the fact that we were able to hold such a, um, I don't know, such a, uh, uh, a patient conversation around this topic, um, it was really, really fascinating, man. I was most fascinated, TK, that we sort of all ended up on the same page, even if we don't have the same beliefs about this. We were able to form a detente with our right. understanding and our misunderstanding. Absolutely, man. Like It was a good illustration of the fact that conversations about our differences are about something deeper than our differences, right? Mm -hmm. It's about the energy that makes connection possible. And what I love so much about the way Dr. Zach Bush had that conversation is he was calm and composed, unabashed, unapologetic the entire time. He felt no need to force anything down our throats. And at the same time, he didn't get defensive or riled up when we asked him questions and, and, and expressed some skepticism about certain possibilities. It was cool. That's how a conversation should be. Mm -hmm. ah, yes. Yeah. And I felt the whole time that there was no, it wasn't a judgmental approach, even though I'm like, I wanted to be like, what the, oh my God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And throughout the whole thing, I, TK has really helped me with this. He's helped me be more curious about other worldviews. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Zach Bush is someone I really respect. I obviously really respect Ryan. When Ryan came to me with this conversation that he wanted to have on the podcast, I said yes, not because I agreed with it. Yeah. And I still can't say that I'm completely on board with any of it. But what we did here, especially through that long form conversation, is we opened up a door for more understanding. Yeah. I don't want to say that, you know, any of us actually believe or disbelieve in it, but able to hold space and have that conversation and listen. Um, that's what I really appreciate about what just went down. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, that's our minimal episode for today. We'll see you on Patreon for the full three hour maximal edition of this episode, which includes answers to a bunch more questions about the gut as well. Not just aliens, but questions like, what can I do about seasonal allergies as I get older? What factors contribute to eating disorders? Plus a million more questions for Dr. Zach Bush and much, much more of less. And if you want to hear all that, check out The Minimalist Private Podcast, patreon.com slash The Minimalist, or click the link in the description. Big thanks to our guest today, Dr. Zach Bush. Head on over to theminimalists.com. You can see all of the show notes will link to not only Zach Bush's website, but his nonprofits and all of the things he talked about throughout the episode today. If y'all leave here today with just one message, please let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Peace. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it